How to escape the heat if you don't have an air conditioner? This only takes five minutes. Tie the... Hello, I'm in a very special place for this video. This is St. Paul de Vence, which is in the south of France. And it's one of the oldest towns in the French Riviera. And it is famous for, you probably guessed it, art. In this video, I'm gonna take you to two locations, the Foundation Mott, as well as the Foundation CAB. And people come from all over the world to see these two institutions, so you are in for a treat. The Foundation Macht was established in 1964 by Marguerite and Ami Macht. The two are some very famous French art dealers who not only represented Alexander Calder, George Braque, Marc Chagall, Alberto Giacometti, Joan Miro, and Fernand Leger, but they were really close friends with the artists as well. The foundation is also France's first private institution, and it was modeled after a lot of the American. So there are two exhibits on view that we're going to see today. The first is titled On the Approach, which is a group show featuring 12 works from the collection from some of the most important minimalist artists of all time. So think Dan Flavin, Kenneth Nolan, Keith Sonnier, Frank Stella, Ann Truitt, Joseph Albers, I could go on and on. <laughs> Mott, as well as Hello.
Ha! Huh. Hey, Veronica. Good morning. How are you? Okay. Evidently, uh, I don't know. It's you, me, and Naomi. Naomi. Mm-hmm. Something like that. I haven't been able to talk to her, but, you know, I guess she's listening in, so. Well, it took me a while to get in. I think it's the system. Yeah? Yeah, it did. And that's unusual. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Not sure what that's all about. So just maybe people are having technical difficulties. Maybe. Maybe. We can give him a few minutes. We're in the yeah, world. I don't I don't think John is coming today because he has to stay healthy. He went to the doctor. Right. Yes. He did. Yeah, he, he told us that yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I knew he wasn't making it, but yeah, you know, kind of like, okay, so where's Bob and Eloise? And, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Rebecca. Rebecca. So, all those folks. Okay. Are you thinking of coming out tomorrow to the plain air to see the brush lady or? I'm thinking of it. If I can, I will. Okay. Because I, you know, um, sometimes when you have a puppy, they, oh. they chew things they're not supposed to, and... No, I that had, never happens. No, it doesn't, and um, she wanted to... Uh, evidently, she wanted to paint. I see. And she chewed my brushes. <gasps> not, all, not all of them. She got three. I, she, got, she got three of them. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, those are the brushes I like using, not the real tiny ones. I think it's the six and the eight. Uh -huh. um, not the flat, the one that has the, I call it the contour edges that looks like silver. a triangle almost. Yes. Yeah, silver. Yes. Yeah, she, she got a hold of those. And I was like, well, you have good taste. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, no, no. So that would be why I would come out is just to replace those. Mm hmm Okay. And hopefully, I'm hoping, but I'm not sure that, you know, she has large tubes of titanium white because I have enough black mm -hmm. and the phyllo blue. I'm starting to learn colors and what they do a little bit better as far as the names instead of saying blue. Mm -hmm. Now, are you looking for oil paint? Yes, yes. Okay. All yes. right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing with Anita. You never really know. What, you don't know. It's yeah, what you going to have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, because all of her stuff is either seconds or overstock. Yeah. And so, you know, it comes either directly from the, the factories or it's stuff that got returned because right. they were overstocked and then and they pass them on to her to try to get right. them and sell them. Yeah, like you go in a store and somebody squeezed the tube of, of oil paint and it's a dent in it, so now they can't sell it to another person. Yeah, yeah. Though I've Situation. never let that blow me down. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't either. Like, no, it's a tube of paint. Okay, it's like, okay. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to squeeze it, it anyway. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have to be perfect. You know, as long yeah, as the lid comes yeah. off and, you know. It's but, sealed. It's, it's good. And then I bought a toothpaste. I call it the toothpaste squeezer. Oh, so yeah. I can just roll it up. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, those so are I have that. Yeah, I, I've got several of those. And, you know, even though I've got several of them, it's one of those things in the studio that just seems to disappear. And, and oh. when you really need it, you can't find it. <laughs> find it, yeah. I gotta go look yeah. at it. <laughs> so that's irritating, you know. Well, and one day I'll I'll have a studio that I'll have everything kind of neat. neat. Yeah, neat. yeah. Well, you know, I do that periodically, and and then it doesn't take long, and it just kind of reverts back to stuff everywhere. Yeah, because all you got to do is you know be work working on a project or two, and yeah. stuff just comes out. You know, it's sitting here and it's sitting there. And... Yeah, I know. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. 
I did hear from your daughter this morning. I got an email from her. Where yeah, she and she had, sent it to the person. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I'm, you know, I'm waiting to hear back from them. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully, you know, that all works out. We can get out there. It looks like a fun place. To go paint. Yeah, I think I think it will work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's just a matter of them, you know, reading the email and putting it in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm optimistic about it. But you know, oh yeah, they were they were they were optimistic as well because she had already spoken to them. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of you know dates and those little um, logistics kind of situation. Okay you know, looking at the university calendar and negotiations. So say mm -hmm. for instance, they have a big thing going on that Thursday. Maybe we go to Thursday before or the Thursday after, depending upon how you schedule the plenary classes. And then the next month, you know, and then if we want to go out, you know, the next, the next, I call it semester, you know, they're getting those dates in place. So everything's in place from that point on. Mm -hmm. But they're open to the community, you know, depending on the type of community activities. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that they don't, they were okay with. So we're good. Just, just the okay needs to be there in writing. Yeah. Well, I was talking to Sabrina the other day and, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, how, how we're going to carry this on through the year you know, to the end of the year, and then in right. the beginning of next year. And uh, it seems like what's going to happen is toward the end of this quarter, uh, when we have bad weather days, for example, right. we, okay. will go, we will sort of make it an automatic thing that we just go to the center and people can okay. be in, indoors and paint rather than because of inclement weather or things like that. Right. And that way, as we get into like the fourth quarter, you know, the end of the year, um, you know, we'll be spending most of our time there. So it will kind of count as an on-site class, you know, at that point. Oh, okay. So, so that means that the space in the studio would be small. Uh, the number in the studio would be smaller. Well, I, you know, we've, we've never gotten more than about nine people out, you know, to actually paint. Now we've had, okay. I think the highest number we ever had was like 12 or maybe 14, but that was mm -hmm. just for like a demo and most people just came and they kind of watched and then they left yeah. after the demo. So, um, you know, but, you know, I think she's looking for ways that she can kind of fill, you know, the, the, the things that downtown is asking for. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah. Because they're, they're wanting to do more, more and more on-site classes. So, so I've heard. Yeah. Okay. And so I guess they they are pretty comfortable with um, this population getting their boosters and up, updates and things like that, as far yeah. as protection that way. And well, and now with the boosters and and the medications that are now on the market, you're less likely to die. Yeah, which is kind of where this thing was headed all the time. Uh, yeah. since there was no great effort in stamping it out, um, right. And really eradicating it, you know, they just sort of, it's no. like, oh, okay. Another thing. All right. Well, we'll, we'll kind of keep care of this little group of people here and then right. the rest of the world can kind of fend for themselves. And that's kind of what they did. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I had um, heard, not from the CDC, but I think CBS, which is what I watch, 
they had someone on and they said, the, the news reporters really went in. They said, you gave us the wrong impression, the wrong message. It wasn't that it would go away. You, at first you said it would go away and we would be okay. But now we're not okay. So now what's the message? They just went in. I was like, yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be kind of kind of accurate. <laughs> that was accurate, yeah. And yeah. I think they got mad because one of the news commentators, Gail King, she got she got the coronavirus not too long ago. She says, I'm I'm boosted. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm good. And I'm careful. I'm good, but I still got it. So I want I would like somebody to tell me how do you how do you get it? Right. That's that's what I would like somebody to tell me. So that well, you could take your own personal precautions, right? Yeah. Or try to. Well, if the only guaranteed way of maybe not getting it is just don't have any contact with any other living human being. Oh, that's not happening. Right. So but how you doing, Eloise? Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. We're we're just being patient here. Um, we've got Naomi and you and Veronica, and I don't know. I'm going to give it another minute or two and see if people can get on or not. Um, did you have problems this morning? No, I kind of do tennis early in the morning, and I was just running late. Oh, okay. you mean getting on here? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not having a problem. No. Okay. okay. Yeah. Richard um, is here, too. Yes, we see Richard. How are you doing this morning, Richard? Good to see you. Okay. Good to be seen. Yeah. We're just being social for a little while, kind of letting some people kind of get online here. You know? We got I may have to leave early. You have what? I may have to leave early. Oh, okay. Well, then we better get rolling, okay? Because we don't want you to miss any of this, okay? Um, anyway, so hopefully everybody's doing okay today. And uh, as, as threatened <laughs> just uh, yesterday and the day before, uh, we're going we're gonna to look at a couple of different artists. And, uh, and actually, I was going to talk about that still life and the process uh, that we were going to go through. And if we have time for that, you know, I'll probably get to that. But I wanted to show you a couple of things uh, first, okay? And um, one, we're going to start with, it's a, it's a little uh, tour of a couple of institutions in the south of France. And so uh, we're going to take a look at that. And I will warn you, okay? For the most part, it's all very contemporary art. Okay, it is not, you know, traditional art by any means. But uh, you know, interesting place. Um, while we're doing this, you know, kind of treat it like uh, like a little bit of a tour. If you've ever been to the south of France and want to, you know, don't really know what it looks like or something like that, take a good look. It's uh, really really quite beautiful, actually. So. We're going to look at that first, and then we'll go look at a couple of artists. And away we go. Hello, I'm in a very special place for this video. This is St. Paul de Vence, which is in the south of France. And it's one of the oldest towns in the French Riviera. It's famous for, you probably guessed it, art. In this video, I'm going to take you to two locations, the Foundation Mutt as well as the Foundation CAB. And people come from all over the world to see these two institutions, so you are in for a treat. The Fondation Macht was established in 1964 by Marguerite and Ami Macht. The two are some very famous French art dealers who not only represented Alexander Calder, Georges Braque, Marc Chagall, Alberto Giacometti, Joan Miro, and Fernand Leger, but they were really close friends with the artists as well. 
The foundation is also France's first private institution, and it was modeled after a lot of the American institutions at the time, like the Guggenheim Foundation, the Barnes Collection, and the Phillips Collection. The architect of the building is Josep Luis Sert, and he created this space in collaboration with the Mox, Miro, and a number of other artists. And you can really see their influence in the various elements of the foundation, such as the sculpture garden that you see here at the entrance. There's also the Giacometti court, which we'll see later, as well as Miro's labyrinth and the bell tower for the chapel. I have to use this for some The foundation work. has one of the largest collections of modern art in Europe, consisting of over 13,000 items. So what we're seeing today is just a small fraction of the collection. Looks like one of your pieces, Richard. This is the Giacometti court, which features sculptures from Alberto Giacometti that were created between 1959 and 1960. And apparently these works were originally commissioned for the Chase Manhattan Bank Plaza in New York. But the project was abandoned, so that's how they ended up here. And I do love New York, but I will say that I prefer the works in this setting, mostly because it has the most beautiful view of St. Paul events. This is one of the indoor gallery spaces, and you can immediately spot the lovely Alexander Calder mobile on the ceiling. It's fitting that there's a large piece by Marc Chagall because he famously lived in St. Paul de Vence, and you can actually see murals of his throughout the city.
You can get some really nice views of the property from up on the roof, especially of Miro's Labyrinth. And Miro created all of these works specifically for the foundation with the help of his ceramist friends, father and son, Josep Lorenz Artigas and Juan Gardi Artigas. We're now in the second indoor gallery space that features a series of rotating exhibits. And this is an exhibit dedicated to the works of the French artist Bernard Monion. Monion? <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just put his name up here. The show features seven large installations that he's created over the past 10 years.
The stained glass window in this room was designed by Miro. And when we take a look through the little window here, we can see a shallow pool that was designed by George Brock and a sculpture by Miro that's similar to the ones that we saw in the entrance. This is the foundation's gift shop, as well as this lovely mural by Chagall. And this is the courtyard where we actually enter the foundation and the sculpture garden you can see here. And this is where we're going to end the tour of the foundation Macht. I hope you enjoyed it. And we're actually gonna head down the street to another foundation, the foundation CAB. The Foundation CAB is a more contemporary foundation, and it was founded in 2012 by Hubert Bonnet, who is a Belgian businessman, and more importantly, an art collector, specifically of minimalist art. So he created this nonprofit space dedicated to the promotion of minimalist and conceptual art. The foundation is based in Brussels, and they just opened this location in 2021. And this location actually has a little mini hotel with four guest rooms, and there's a restaurant called Soul, which is where we're going to have a nice little lunch, and there's also a bookstore on the premises. So there are two exhibits on view that we're going to see today. The first is titled On the Approach, which is a group show featuring 12 works from the collection from some of the most important minimalist artists of all time. So think Dan Flavin, Kenneth Nolan, Keith Sonnier, Frank Stella, Ann Truitt, Joseph Albers, could go on and on. <laughs> For just $39.95, Perfect Amino will destroy any bodybuilder diet when it comes to building muscle.
The second exhibit on view is by the Belgian artist Anne Veronica Janssens. And this is a light installation that's meant to represent or to be a response to a series of unpublished works by Dan Flavin. And throughout these works, light is experienced in different states. It's diffused, reflected, absorbed, projected, and transformed. And like most light installations, it's, it's impossible to not become part of the exhibit as a viewer. And the art actually continues outside of the foundation as well. You can see all the cars that are parked here. Most of them are parked for the Foundation Macht, but obviously the CAB as well. But you can see here, there's actually a little sculpture garden on the outside of the building as well. And this is where I'm going to leave you with these absolutely breathtaking views from St. Paul's events, honestly. It's such a beautiful city. I, this view never gets old. So this is where I'll leave you to enjoy this, and I will see you all in the next video. Uh, there you go. All right. What do you guys think of that little tour? Like a lot of wasted space. I would wasted. love to go there. Yeah, I'd love to go there. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, I don't know that, you know, I, I, kind, of, I kind of go along with Gene. I think the first thing I would do is clear those galleries out and then hang, a, you know, hang some of the artwork there. <laughs> they're they're great yeah. they're beautiful spaces and the architecture is stunning the view the, 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 architect, the, the grounds are gorgeous mm -hmm. yeah well my question is some of the paintings at the very last look like plain canvases with colors just along the uh, edges you know, the rims like where the wood would be is that correct or was there a painting on the white part i couldn't well, tell the video not all that clear yeah. Yeah, well, there was paint on the white part, though it was probably just white paint uh, or subtle shades of. Or, That's what I was you know, wondering. If the video is not clear with clarity. Yeah, but all the last place that we looked at it was it was all sort of dedicated to a minimalist art. Right. Okay. Right. You know, uh, unlike the place that we looked at previously, which was all contemporary art, but it wasn't really just minimalist, okay? Yes, I missed that part. Yeah, but uh, you know, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful place, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is, it's like, there's lots and lots of places like that in the world that you can go to and, you know, see some beautiful art and enjoy the culture and, you know, so. You know, if you get a chance, 
And now I've been to the South of France and I've actually lived in Lyon for a while, which is a beautiful city. Um, and yeah, I would encourage all of you, you know, if you get a chance to travel, that's a good place to go, you know? In fact, um, my very favorite city in the world that I've actually been in is uh, Lyon. So if, if you ever get a chance to go there, it's fascinating and very, very different from living in America. So yeah, you're going to do a lot of, you'll, you'll have to do a lot of walking, there, but that's what the French do. So in fact, they've got the part of the old city. They have it all closed down to absolutely no traffic. It's all by foot you know, and stuff, but it's, it's really a wonderful place if you ever go there. And, uh, Anyway, anybody have any other comments about the place, the art, anything else? Hi, Rebecca, how are you doing? Fine, thank you, how are you? Good. Good. All right, so I guess we're gonna move on now. All right, so on to the next thing. All right, so, uh, we're gonna listen to this young woman as she makes a, uh, a review of uh, some art supplies that she ordered off of amazon.com. And I wasn't aware of this, but Amazon is now putting out their own line of art There's art three supplies. things I love in this world. One, it's saving some coin. Two, it's art supplies. And lastly, not leaving the house. Who would have guessed? <laughs> and on today's episode of Amazon is Taking Over the World, Amazon combined all of those three things by creating their own budget-friendly, Amazon-branded version of the top-selling art supplies. And today, as an avid user of art supplies, my felt my... Mm -hmm. Okay. We can get into this video. In order for you to fully understand this brand, there's a huge premise that you need to know about. Diapers.com. <laughs> I know I know that sounds crazy and it sounds like it has nothing to do with the video, but just trust me. In 2009, Diapers.com was the hotspot to get cheap diapers delivered right to your door. And the current owner of Amazon, aka the world's richest man, aka Jeff Bezos, aka the real life Lex Luthor. <laughs> He and his company took notice of how profitable Divers.com was becoming. So Amazon offered to buy Divers.com, to which they said, no, why, why, would, why would we do that? And in response to that rejection, Amazon did what I believe to be the literal most petty thing in existence. Amazon lowered their diaper prices so much so they were on track to lose over a hundred million dollars just so they can get the customers from Divers.com over to Amazon.com. And at that point, losing a huge, huge, huge amount of their customers, Divers.com was no longer profitable. They had to lay off over 200 people, close their website, and sell their main company to the only person who would be willing to buy it, Amazon.com. And just like that, Amazon wiped out their main competition and gained control of the diaper market. <laughs> So yeah, circle it around in 2020, they've expanded past diapers and now in the art supply game, which really intrigued me. So I plan to be very thorough in this video, completely honest. If I like something, I'm gonna say it. If I don't like something, I'll also say it. So now that you understand the full context, I have three art supplies here for you today. And with that being said, let's unbox it. Is the Amazon Basics Premium? Come on. <laughs> what are we doing here? Come on. Back 
up a little bit. Try it again. Now this is the Amazon Basics Premium Colored Pencils in a 72 count. The first thing that I gotta say is that I'm really impressed with the sleek packaging. I think this looks really, really nice. And I even appreciated their eco-friendly cardboard packaging. I think that's really good for Amazon. And the claims are they're soft and smooth, they have thick cores to resist breakage and longer lasting usage, they have rich saturated pigments, and one of the more questionable claims is that they're artist quality, meaning that they're made out of like the highest quality pigments, so we'll be the judge of that. Now these were made to be a cheaper alternative to my favorite ride or die Prismacolor Premier Soft Core Colored Pencils. Now this is the 72 pack. I am. Now I gotta say I'm pretty impressed with the color selection. There's a really, really nice range of colors. One thing I see often with color pencils is there'll be a lot of blue, but not a lot of yellow, or a lot of brown, not a lot of gray. I gotta hand it to Amazon. Whoever they hired to create the color palette, they did an incredible job. Now every single colored pencil, thank the Lord, has the name of the color on here, as well as the corresponding number to the back of the tin. I just gotta say, this is so surreal right now to see the word Amazon on a colored pencil. I never in a million, billion years would have thought I would be in this scenario. It's so strange. Now, because that color selection is just so good, I'm kind of curious to know if they copied the exact same color selection from Prismacolors. So let's see. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, they're different. I mean, there are some similarities, like for example, the metallics are very similar. And of course, with 72 colors, you gotta get all the primaries and the secondaries. But one thing I gotta say is Prismacolor has way more vibrant colors than the Amazon basic ones. Like for example, these two neon greens, these two together are way more vibrant and bright and neon than anything else in the packaging. So yeah, the colors are similar, not the same. All right, let's check this bad boy out and see how well they work. Oh no, that's gonna bug me. Uh, but anyway, the show must go on. All right, let's try out Kingfisher Blue and see how it works. Oh my gosh, let me make sure I'm using the Amazon one because oh my gosh. Okay, I know this is like the very first swatch, but I've been using Prismacolors for so long. If I was to close my eyes right now and you were to switch out one of these and tell me it was a Prismacolor, I would believe you. Right off the bat, this has that exact same smooth formula that I love about Prismacolor. Wow, that is not what I was expecting. If I'm going to be honest here, I was expecting these to just be like cheap colored pencils, but I'm a little shook right now. What the heck? We'll try out another color. We'll try uh, magenta. Oh, and they blend the same too. Oh my goodness. This is actually crazy. All right, let's put this to the test because just from that first watch alone, I'm not gonna lie, I'm already blown away. So I got two very, very similar colors. I'm gonna blend them and we'll see. So first up will be Prismacolor. Prisma color, boom, see, as usual. Hmm. Base. Bezos might be on something. Back that up a little bit and see. For the first time in my channel, I have never done this, but I'm about to do a. Okay, let's try it again. If you were to switch out one of these and tell me it was a Prisma color, I would. You. Right off the bat, this has that exact same smooth formula that I love about Prismacolor. Wow, that is not what I was expecting. If I'm going to be honest here, I was expecting these to just be like cheap colored pencils, but I'm a little shook right now. What the heck? 
We'll try out another color. We'll try uh, magenta. Oh, and they blend the same too. Oh my goodness. This is actually crazy. All right, let's put this to the test because just from that first watch alone, I'm not gonna lie, I'm already blown away. So I got two very, very similar colors. I'm gonna blend them and we'll see. So first up will be Prismacolor. Prismacolor, boom, seamless as usual. Now for the Amazon Basic ones. Amazon Basics, boom, also a seamless transition. Guys, our overlord, Jeff Bezos, might be onto something. For the first time in my channel, I have never done this, but I'm about to do a second blend test because I'm a little shook with how well that blended the first time. Wow, they blended again seamlessly. I'm uncomfortable with how well that works. I'm um, just curious. I wonder if they layer on top of each other. And by the way, I'm sorry if it seems like I'm pressing really, really hard. My desk is super unstable right now. Uh, so I'm giving the illusion that I'm like going in super hard and shaking my desk, but it's actually just my desk is old. Wow. Okay, wow. And even layers perfectly on top of each other. Uh, all I'm saying is in all my years of using colored pencils, I've never found a formulation that works literally exact same as the Prismacolor. This is crazy. I'm going to do some swatches of some like really weird, unique colors, and we'll see how the pigment does. Hi, Siri. Can you play Freak on a Leash by Korn? Now playing Freak on a Leash by Korn. Earlier I had mentioned how well they performed, how smooth they were, and I've never seen a formula so similar to Prismacolors, but there's been a new plot development I found to catch. There is very much a difference in the amount of pigment. For example, the Amazon Basic Black is just that much lighter than the Prismacolor Black. The Neons, it's a very drastic difference between the two. While the pigments in a Prismacolor is about 100%, the pigments in Amazon Basics is about an 80%. If you're doing realism, you want that extra white, you want that extra black to pull out shadows. So yeah, that difference in pigment could definitely be a problem for a lot of artists. Uh, the second potential issue is the barrel size. Now, when I think of thick, first thing I think of is myself. <laughs> and the second thing is the Karen Dosh colored pencils. Amazon says the barrels are thick, but they're actually just the standard colored pencil size. And the whole entire reason as to why you would want to have a thick barrel is that it protects the lead on the inside. And lastly, and this one's probably the biggest issue that I've found so far, it doesn't say anything about the light fastness, how archival it is. Even people online were asking questions and didn't get an answer. Not knowing the light fastness and how archival these colored pencils are, that is a huge, huge, huge deal breaker for so many artists out there. Especially if you're working on commissions or in the professional realm, you need your colored pencils to last and you need to know how long they're going to last. Now, just to make sure I'm getting the correct information about these colored pencils, I went ahead and I created a drawing that's half Amazon Basics and half Prismacolor. And yep, same results. They worked almost identical, but of course, Amazon Basics didn't have that extra vibrancy and pigment that Prismacolor had. So, do I recommend these? Yes, hell to the yes. Best way that I can truly describe these colored pencils is they are the truest knockoff of Prismacolor I have ever found, ever. I recommend these to every single person as long as you're not like professional or doing commissions or maybe you just want to be like extra bougie and have that extra vibrancy. And if you are interested in purchasing anything that I've named, I will leave an affiliate link down below. Uh, so yeah, we still have two more art supplies to go, but I can truly say I'm pretty impressed with this very first one. Now that want to be like extra bougie and have that extra vibrancy and if you
thing that I've named, I will leave an affiliate link down below. Uh, so yeah, we still have two more art supplies to go, but I can truly say I'm pretty impressed with this very first one. Now this leads us to the second art supply. And guys, if this art supply is good, it could be a game changer. The next art supply that I'm about to show you is only $7 for a 17-piece art set. But first I want to talk about how it came, which is in this cardboard packaging, which again, I think that's fine, especially since it is technically more eco-friendly. But this specific art supply, as you're about to see, is very, very, very delicate. So I'm very curious to see if it got damaged at all. Oh, it came perfectly. Oh, thank God. This is the Amazon Basics 17-piece drawing and charcoal set. It comes with a sharpener, a variety of drawing pencils, not one, but two erasers, a tortillion, three charcoal pencils in a variety of hardnesses, and it comes with four Conte sticks. That's incredible! Now this one's a little bit less of an exact knockoff, I guess you could say, compared to the colored pencils, but I am going to compare it to one of the biggest, if not the biggest name when it comes to charcoal pencils. Generals. Generals Charcoal. Now, I gotta say, I really like the design of these charcoal Amazon pencils. With the matte barrel and the gold, these look really, really nice. Honestly, it's a little creepy. <laughs> it's kind of creepy like how nice all of this stuff is. Usually with knockoffs, the company doesn't know what makes it good, but this is like really, really good. Uncomfortably good. I just woke up, so I'm sorry if my voice sounds super deep right now. I'm all, hello, ladies. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this side is the pencils, this side is the Conte stick. I had to use a royal charcoal pencil because the general set only came with two. What I said about the colored pencils, you can apply that exact same thing here to the charcoal. They work literally the exact same, even more so than the colored pencils, if you can believe it or not. But the name brand is just slightly better, just slightly more pigmented, just slightly more smoother. When I was doing the drawing segment, they were so similar that I just started freely switching out the General's brand with the Amazon brand, and I could not tell a difference between the two. But as always, there's a catch. Throughout the entirety of this video, I've been comparing the Pentel Graphic Gear Pencil with the Amazon Basics Graphic Gear Pencil. And I've come to the conclusion, Amazon Basics is just that, basics. This brand is based on getting the name brand art supplies and they're cutting corners with production costs by saving money in very sneaky ways. For example, the graphic pen, the name brand is slightly larger than the Amazon Basics. It's also a little bit heavier and has more luxurious details like the pencil ripper. While the Amazon Basic one is just that, it's a basic graphic pencil. The Conte stick, it's ever so slightly smaller than the name brand. The Tortillion, it's made out of compressed paper as opposed to the more expensive option, rolled rice paper Tortillions. Like I mentioned with the colored pencils and the graphite, the pigment isn't fully fully there. Basic is the most incredible way to describe it. If you want a basic colored pencil, here it is. If you want a basic wrapping pencil with no funny stuff, here it is. If you need some basic charcoal, here it is. There's no luxury when it comes to Amazon Basics. And honestly, I'm cool with that. I understand that. I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but our overlord Jeff Bezos, he's onto something. <laughs> I recommend all of this stuff for people who are looking for art supplies at a cheap price? Yes, hell yeah. But if you do want that little extra edge that you would find with a name brand, then get the name brand. But most people just want the basic job done, and that's what Amazon Basics is. It gets the job done. So anyway, guys, thank you so much again for watching. I will leave a playlist down below. Of okay. Anybody got any thoughts about any of that? I am not a fan of colored pencils, so it was not beneficial to me. I was very surprised that uh, Amazon, the power of Amazon being, a, I guess, almost a monopoly and wiping out a whole business. 
I really use Amazon, but I'm having second thoughts now. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is one of the business models with both Amazon and Walmart. <laughs> they both do that. Yes, they come in, they find a area in the market that they want to dominate and they will manipulate the market to put the competition out of business. You know, so yes, welcome to, uh, you know, business in the uh, 21st welcome century. Welcome to the money world. That's right, you know, you know, if you can't, you know, and, and see that would be one of my concerns and one of my fears is that if, if you, now you can go on Amazon, right? And you can buy Prismacolor pencils, right? And you can buy all the other art supplies. Just, you know, for me, I won't be buying the Amazon basics, right? For several reasons, you know, one, I don't wanna support Amazon's move into the market to produce their own art supplies at a lesser quality. And B, I wanna support those products that I know I can get the quality from and, you know, will do the job. So that's my take on it. But, but I, I figured, you know, I would play that, let you guys kind of take a look at it. You know, anybody have any other thoughts about that? I wonder if China's gonna do that to the US. I'm sorry, what? I wonder how quickly China is going to do all of that type of thing to the United States. Um, well, yeah, and it's, it's really not China. Um, it's a lot of U.S. corporations who have manufacturing, you know, in China, China <laughs> who are doing that to the U.S., yes. Amazon just happens to be one of those because I'm sure that most of those knockoff sets are probably made either in China, Thailand, Vietnam, somewhere like that. Well, all your clothes and everything else is too, just about. Yeah, yeah pretty much so, yes. Yes, you know, including your microchips. Yeah. So, yeah, but that's a whole nother discussion. Uh, anybody else before we move on? No. No. Now, Avatar, you need to unmute yourself. Right. I, I think also some of us have been uh, exposed to art for long, and we have already quite a bit of supply. So, and we, we hear from you and from others what are the recommended brands. Mm -hmm. so I think it might be tempting to buy a seven dollar box of uh, colored pencils, but if you already have some, yeah. Well, now the yeah, now the colored pencils were thirty dollars, but that's but to give it to get an equivalent in Prismacolor, you know, the Prismacolor is twenty dollars more. Okay, so it's fifty. Yeah. The Amazon knockoff is thirty. Okay, so they're they're definitely they're trying to provide you a similar product, maybe not quite the same quality, but considerably less money. So. And they give you more pencils. No, no, they're both they they were both. They're both seventy two. They're yeah. both seventy two package. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She compared to seventy two. I just don't use colored pencils myself, and I really don't know. But I thought the color pencils that she was using said it was Prisma color. Looked like a smaller set. Um, but that box was a little thicker, and there's like three or four layers. Oh, okay. Yeah, see, I can't but, see that on the television. Yeah, screen but it's yeah, it, it's, yeah, they were all seventy twos though, you know. Okay. So that she was comparing. I think I would, I think I would be concerned with what is in the Amazon basics as far as toxic materials, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of questions I have since they're not answering people right now. Right. 
Um, well, they're not answering people and there's nothing actually on the packaging itself that makes right. any claim to them. Well, they say that they're artist quality, but does that really mean that they're archival? And does that really mean that they're color fast? She, she right. asked a lot of good questions and yeah, you know, yeah. If, if I were going to spend $30 on a set of colored pencils, I would want to know those things. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, their business practices, I'm not really excited about, especially when they put that company out of business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I have a, a, some concerns with that, of course, and will limit my purchases from Amazon after watching that. Right. Um, and know that if you have a great idea and it's a good business and Amazon approaches you, you know, what do you do in that case? You, yeah, you know that they're gonna, they're gonna go for you. So it's either yes or no. And the no means that they're gonna put you out of business. Yeah. Well, and well, they, they could put you out of business if they can pull your customer base away from you and to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. And this goes back to, and this is a philosophical issue that I, you know, I, I share with people many times, you know, your choices, you know, um, as far as like, if you really want to vote in the world and make a difference in the world, the best way to vote is how you spend your money. Yeah. Because if you buy products that you feel comfortable with that you like the company philosophy or the quality of the product is you know superior or what you you know what you really like working with then you know that's a vote you know yeah. um, if on on the other hand you're of the mindset that well it doesn't matter what I'm going to save a few dollars, you know, then you're going to go the other direction. Right. But the consequence of that is, okay. You know, if they, if they are successful at pulling a large number of people who are buying art supplies away from these other manufacturers, they are there. They are going to close those manufacturers down and, what you end up with is one company monopolizing a whole industry. Yeah. Yeah. So do, do be cautious, you know, and again, I'm not against shopping on Amazon, but when I start buying products on Amazon and places like that, I like to know where those products are coming from and if I am like buying art supplies, like for example, I just, uh, I looked on Amazon to try to buy some varnish, right? And I wanted this Windsor Newton satin varnish. Well, they didn't have it available, but binders did. And so I ordered it through binders, right? Right. And, um, you know, any any time that I can take the route of supporting a a like a local or a regional art store or you know like a, a regular retail store um, that has other materials and things that I would use on a regular basis, I'll do that. <coughs> yeah, so, that's just me. Okay, but that's also why I won't set foot in a Walmart you know, to buy anything because I don't like, you know, I don't like the way they do business. So, but that's just me. Okay. No, um, it's not just you. I don't go to Walmart either because it's, it's a little hectic. So no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, looking, looking at uh, companies and their practices and yeah, you know, make a choice. Yeah. 
All right. So let's see. Now let's look at. There's a couple of artists that I wanted to share with you, and uh, we're going to look at some of their work, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about what they're doing. Okay. Da, da. All right. So the first guy we're going to start with. His name is uh, Frederick Basile, okay? And uh, you'll recognize him as an Impressionist.
Okay. Anybody uh, familiar with his work? No. Never heard of him. Okay. Well, just so he was from 1860s to the early 1900s, 1910 maybe? No, actually he was in the early 1860s. He okay. actually exhibited um, within the first couple of Impressionist exhibitions. He okay. was a contemporary of Degas, Monet, all those folks. Um, so he was with that group of uh, Monet, uh, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember my history about the, the um, impressionistic artists, but didn't they get started because they could not exhibit with the elites and so they started their own, is that? More or less, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, he was, he was one of the original first impressionists. Okay. 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 Now, unfortunately, um, after the first couple of exhibitions, France went to war and they had this little thing called the Prussian War and uh, Bazille as well as several other Impressionist painters ended up going to the war you know as soldiers. Bazille unfortunately got killed and so that kind of cut his art career pretty short. Uh, he died probably either in his late 20s or maybe very early 30s. Um, but if you look at the amount of work that they showed, and that was not everything that he did, he still produced a very large body of work, you know, before he was killed. So, but yeah, he was one of the original Impressionist painters, right? Anybody got any questions or comments? Things you liked, things you didn't like? I think you're muted, Rebecca. Sorry, I thought his um, uh, classical pictures of the formal paintings of flowers was um, very detailed and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he, you know, he was, he was traditionally trained, okay. Um, and he actually went through you know, a lot of the academic classes and things like that, you know, to learn how to paint. So he knew, you know, he knew the traditional process. He, he was very familiar with all of that. Um, one thing about him, he had very good drawing skills, you know, and he, he was a very good draftsman. Um, yeah. Now that's something that some of the later impressionists you know, really didn't have uh, so much, but but he definitely did. Uh, he was a very good draftsman. He and Degas both were excellent draftsmen. Um, but yeah, I I liked you know I liked a lot of his landscapes in particular. Uh, I think that's kind of where he really shined was you know with his landscape work and. Um, he was also, he and Monet were two of the Impressionists early on that really pushed the Impressionists to go out and paint outdoors from life rather than in the studio. So, I liked his flowers, his floral paintings, but I did not like his figures because they seemed uninteresting and bland and mm -hmm. dull, sad. Mm -hmm. They yeah. didn't have too much of a personality going there for them. Right. Well, I think a lot of the figurative work that they showed was some of the very early work, and it would have been influenced by that, you know, academy. And um, one of the things that the Impressionists struggled with, uh, and particularly in the early period, because quite a few of them were academically trained, they sort of they had to kind of break out of that historical painting mode, right? And, and Bazille was one of those people who suffered from that, you know? 
he produced a lot of figurative work in that sort of historical, you know, style. And because that was what was popular at the time. And, uh, and no, I don't, I don't think that his figures were nearly as interesting as somebody like Degas, who rather than doing, you know, historical painting, would, you know, go to dance studios and things and draw actual living people, you know, at that time, you know, doing what people were doing, you know, uh, at that period of time. So, uh, you know, so yeah, there's a difference there. You know. um, if you look at Bazile and then you look at somebody like Bouguereau or Ang or any of the, you know, traditional French artist from the Academy, you know, a lot of that work was very, you know, he was, he was trying to do something very much so like that um, to gain acceptance, you know, within, you know, the salon. So, but unfortunately it didn't work out for him. So for a lot of different reasons. All right. So let's, Take a look. I think we got uh, we got time for a couple of really short uh, looks at a uh, few different artists, and so there was a guy that I came across that I thought was really really interesting. Um, Sanford, um, you know, because we had seen another sort of surrealist artist. And uh, this is one I think that you'll find really interesting. Now he's contemporary. Okay, I mean, he's out there doing stuff today. Thank 
What did you think of uh, Victor's work? He was too far out there for me. I couldn't he get did. the image. I, I have to question who calls, who says that's art? Who, who says that's art? Yeah, it became really gross after that. Looked like a chicken without the head and then the knife and then everything got really yucky. A little bit dark, yes. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Every time he had a nightmare, he had another. Yeah, lots of nightmares. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, being a contemporary surrealist, okay, yeah, you know, they deal a lot with dreams and, you know, different things going on in the world. So, you know, human, the human condition. Um, so overall, I guess, you know, it was kind of a, a thumbs down on, on Victor's work. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I have to be honest with you, you know, there's things that I actually like about his work. Um, you know, technically he's a good painter. I don't know that, I don't know that I could relate to a lot of what he's trying to say or the message, but you know, the technical aspect of the use of color, composition, painting, you know, actually applying paint, these drawing skills, things like that, you know, are all, you know, relatively impressive. You know, so, you know, if you can appreciate it from that standpoint, I guess. Um, okay. We've got about 15 more minutes. All right. Well, let's see if, let's see if I can't find somebody you might like. So, um, so it's not the guy we were going to do with Frederick Brazil. Um, it's too far. Yeah, I guess it's this guy right here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's let's look at him. See what you think.
Okay. Any comments? I think he got the landscapes down real well. Yes, I think he did. <laughs> okay. Figures were all uh, skinny uh, white women. That's all he did is figures, right? That's all I saw. No, he did a lot of, he did a lot of landscapes. No, I mean the figures, the figure, figures of paintings. Oh, oh. Yeah. Well, he did a lot of portraits. And then, yeah, there was a lot of, like, yeah, female figure studies and things like that. I didn't see any. I thought I saw, I don't remember seeing any males. Were there? 
or children? Uh, not that they showed, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's probably a small smattering of his work. <laughs> so whether he ever did male nudes or not, I, I don't know. But I'm, I'm sure if he uh, was trained academically, which he was, um, that he would have done male nudes as well. You know, at least during his training, whether he ever did that, you know, once he got out and started painting and producing a body of work, I, I don't really know all that much. So. I do remember seeing a, a statue of a man that he painted. Mm -hmm. Classical statue. Yeah. But anyway, it was interesting. I liked it better than I did the last one. <laughs> okay. After, after, the, after the shock of the first guy before, Stefukin, mm -hmm. uh, this guy seems pretty tame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one, one guy was Russian and the other guy is British. And so, yeah, the British <laughs> could be uh, a <laughs> little <laughs> more conservative, maybe. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. What is the Russian guy's name? Uh, I can't pronounce it, but I'll, I'll try to spell it for you. How, how is that? Um, okay, Victor. S-A-F-O-N-K-I-N. Safonkin, maybe? You know. I'm sure I'm butchering it, but <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Such a stark contrast between those two. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you're looking at a contemporary modern painter, and you're looking at somebody who was really around about the time, you know, of post impressionism up until the early 1900s, right? So the styles and the aesthetics were very different, you know, between those two. So. It's almost like the, the Russian guy was trying to dig into the soul and the symbolic uh, effects of all the horrors that can come up. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, you know, being a surrealist painter, that's kind of what they do, <laughs> you know. If you look at Salvador Dali and Magritte and, um, you know, any of the other surrealist painters, they, they all, you know, like M.C. Escher, for example, you know, he, uh, you know, it was all about, you know, this illusion of space and form and distorting things and kind of getting into the psychological aspect of, of, you know, how people would react to their work, right? You know, things that it would bring up for them. So, but that's, that's kind of the whole point of surrealism, in a sense. So, the Dali, though, was very precise and delicate in his, um, in, in my view, the surrealist part was there, but it was not overpowering, overwhelming, violent. Yeah. Violent. Well, and that's what I was kind of saying earlier is you may not, you may not relate to the message that he's, you know, kind of giving. But if you look at the technical aspects of his painting um, or his ability to paint and use color and, and things like that, his work is actually, you know, pretty interesting. So, yeah, and there's a lot that you can learn, you know, from looking at his work, whether you like the message or not, right? Yeah, it's kind of like the guy that we looked at yesterday. Um, what is it, Borkin or something like that, or, you know, who did sort of the, the, the landscapes and it was always a stormy sky and there was always like a small town and it was like, you got this kind of ominous feeling that something was about to happen, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, you may not like the message, but if you look at the technical aspects of the painting, the use of color, um, you know, they're still very, very highly skilled artist and could really use the materials that they were working in to good effect, you know, to, to tell the story or get, you know, get their message across. So. I'm sorry, I can't, what? I wonder if anybody would take it in their living room, any of his room. You wonder if... If they would, if anybody would hang it, at this art, oh. to the play in the living room. Yeah, well, I mean, um, we, we kind of had that discussion yesterday, and I uh, think Rebecca asked, it's like, you know, well, who would buy that? And <laughs> the fact is, you know, he's pretty well collected. So there are people who will buy it, will hang it. Okay. Just not Rebecca, you know. Oh. Or Eloise. Or Eloise. <laughs> okay. You know, or maybe not anybody here in this, this particular group, right? But, you know. Well, in, in, in their time, how well did their work sell? Because I know it's collected now. Oh, you mean um, like Glenn? Um, well, he's he was, you know, a fairly successful portrait painter. Okay. And historical painter in Britain. Um, you know, the guy that we just saw previously, I don't really know that much about, you know. Um, but he's he's a more contemporary painter. But I'm I'm fairly certain that He's producing a fairly large body of work, so I would imagine that he's got an outlet for it somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, how much he's getting, you know, for those works and things like that, I'm, I don't really know, so. All right. Anybody got any other questions? All right. So uh, just a reminder, tomorrow we are going to be at Heritage Park. Uh, the brush lady will be showing up around about 11 o'clock. That's Anita Stewart is her name. And uh, she may actually hang out and paint with us tomorrow. So um, if you wanna get uh, some fairly good quality, but discounted art, you know, supplies like brushes, I don't know what kind of paint she has, you know, it's always kind of a, you know, up in the air, you know, she usually doesn't have a lot of anything, but, uh, you know, but if you want to come check her out tomorrow, she'll be there from 11 to 1230. And uh, what's the name of the park again? Heritage Park in Sandy Springs. Yeah. Charles, do you plan to do you plan to do any kind of uh, lesson tomorrow? No. Okay. No, no, because between her being there and the time that we have, you right. know. Yeah. Now I will say next, not not tomorrow, but next week. Okay, we're going to make another attempt at going to. Uh, Morgan Falls, the, the upper, you know, up above the dam where the park is. And I'll, I'll try that still life demo again. Okay. And so if you guys want to come out and paint a still life, you know, I'll, I'll bring probably a lot of the same stuff out there. And, and we'll, we'll try it minus the rain, we hope. Okay. And wind and lightning, all that fun stuff that we had the week before. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Well, in that case, thank you all for coming. And I guess, uh, well, I'll see some of you tomorrow. And if not, then I'll see you on Friday 
at the uh, drawing class. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh -huh. You all take care. You too.